Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, welcome back to our lead educators and welcome to this session for our external teachers who have signed up for this. Uh, my name is Sophie Allen. I am from the National Space Academy. And today we are going to be looking at uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, and specifically, we are going to be speaking to our guest today, who is Professor Alistair Glass. Now, he is the Mid-Infrared, or MIRI, Instrument Scientist and Commissioning Lead on the James Webb Space Telescope. And for our lead educators, uh, we're getting a slightly different look at uh, involvement with the Webb Telescope. So a really good opportunity to be asking some questions about things on an operational level. So we're going to be very excited to uh, chat to Alistair for this. Um, Alistair, thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and I was hoping, could we start off with just uh, for those teachers that might be joining us who are less familiar with the Webb Telescope project, um, would you be able to give us a, a, a short overview of the project and more importantly of your role and what it is that you are, are doing on the project? So I, I thought I'd start, you know, the, I made this slide, so I just like showing it. So this is a, a sort of very, very basic what is astronomy, right, in, in the context of physics and, uh, and um, you know, research sciences. So observational, that's the key thing, a purely observational science based on observing, looking at light, yeah, taking pictures, measuring the colors of light. So spectroscopy is, is becoming more and more important, uh, has been over the past 20, 30 years. So it's kind of, it's physics, but where you can't control the experiment. We can't build a star, we can't tweak a black hole, you can't fiddle with things, right, with the, the you know, all you can do is observe. So. Martin Harwick, great American astronomer from the 70s and 80s, discoveries in astronomy, the inevitable result of building instrumentation which expands the observable volume of parameter space. It's that kind of, you know, build it and you will find something uh, is, is the idea. So here in this illustration here, there's us a little eyeball at the center of, of, of knowledge with what we know, the stars around here, and then the, the boundaries of our parameter space, parameters here, which are how, how detailed you can see, how much, how far away you can see, what, what, what accuracy you can determine one color from another color. These are all observable parameters of the universe. And then outside our, our, our bubble of what we know and what we can do observationally is the unknown. And then, you know, the bubble, the idea is expanding the bubble by building new powerful instrumentation that will inevitably almost is, lead to new discoveries. And that's what the JWST is all about. Okay. Another great quote. And I, from Martin Rees, Astronomer Royal, progress in cosmology and high energy astrophysics has been owed 95% to advancing instruments and technology, less than 5% to armchair theory. And of course, Martin Rees is a, is a great theoretician. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of, uh, it, it really tells you that astronomy is really built on the foundations of the observatories. Um, yeah. Okay, so the exploration volume, you, you're all over familiar with this diagram, I'm sure. Here's the, the, the electromagnetic spectrum running from you know, gamma rays through to radio. Our visible light here is, is always represented as this little rainbow strip in the middle. What the JWST is about is the infrared part of the spectrum. But wavelengths running from, these are in meters, so this is a micron out to 30 microns. Okay. Zooming in on this, re this wavelength region, so this is the wavelength scale at the bottom going from 1 to 25 microns. This is the transmission spectrum that you would see if you look from one of our best observatories at the moment, summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And so ideally, you know, if you're out in space where the JWST is, this would just be unity right across here. There's nothing absorbing the light between you and a distant star. If you're sitting on top of even a very high mountain, you see all of these absorption bands. And so you can't see the stars at these particular wavelengths. So this is one of the key reasons for having a, a space born observatory like JWST. The other thing I'd want to point out to two, two things. One of them, the things that are doing the absorbing in, 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 of this light are molecules. And they're, all, they're, they're molecules, carbon dioxide, water, critically ozone, which are all associated with signs of life, you know, understandably, because these are constituents of our own terrestrial atmosphere. We breathe the oxygen that is associated with this very bright ozone feature, which happens to sit at a wavelength of nine and a half microns. Right, so it gives you an indication. If you want to try and observe exoplanets and look for signs of 
you know, I'm, I'm not saying signs of life, but look for molecules in, in the atmospheres of exoplanets, you want to be working in the infrared. And you really don't want to be working from the surface of the Earth because you, anything you, any astronomical signature is going to be masked by the Earth's own atmosphere. OK, but that's not the really big gain that JWST has. The really big gain comes from sensitivity. It's, it's about how faint an object you can see. And it's, you know, as I say here, new horizons in sensitivity, especially at the longer wavelengths where MIRI operates. So there are four instruments on JWST, four cameras. Uh, three of them work at wavelengths from one to five microns. MIRI operates from five out to about 25 microns. So we're unique and, you know, uniquely interesting. Okay, this is a, a, a kind of a complex diagram. This is a sensitivity diagram. The only thing you really need to know about here is that the further, the lower down you are, your instrument is in this, or your observatory is in this diagram, the, the more sensitive you are. Uh, and critical, in one way of looking at it is the faster you can observe a faint target. So if you have MIRI trying to observe a distant galaxy, that it takes it, it, it would take MIRI a minute to do what the best previous observatory, which was the Spitzer Space Observatory, it would take the Spitzer a week to make the same observation. So in terms of speed and efficiency, this is a huge gain. We have a five-year mission um, for, for the JWST. It's planned to last for five years, but it, would, it should be able to do the science equivalent to what Spitzer could have done in pure sensitivity terms over centuries. So key thing. Okay, so I've mentioned exoplanets. Um, and it's, it's, which is kind of one of the interesting things about JWST when we compare it to its real predecessor, which is the Hubble Space Telescope. Because the JWST was conceived in the, back in the 90s as a successor to the Hubble, particularly for looking at high redshift objects, the distant universe. So, I mean, some of you may know the first exoplanet was actually discovered in 1995, right? And so the JWST was more than a twinkle in, in the eye of the community in 95. It had been designed to look at, at distant objects when exoplanets came along. It has turned out that most of the JWST science interest now, the real focus is for observing exoplanets. So we've kind of had to repurpose the observatory over the past 20 years to meet these new science goals, which has gone, you know, it, it's, it's happened pretty well. We can talk about that in a while. Anyway, so HST, Explored the Sky in Visible Wavelengths, uh, again, you might be familiar with this as the ultra deep, uh, deep field from, uh, from HST taken during the uh, 90s. And all of these dots are galaxies. In terms of this, how far away these galaxies are, this, is a, this diagram is showing us on the left, present day, and the Big Bang. The most distant thing you can see is the, is the wall of, of uh, reionizing um, uh, uh, hydrogen uh, in the very, very early universe. Um, and uh, the most distant objects, the Hubble, could, most of the things you see in this image are at a redshift of about seven, which is redshift seven or eight here. Okay, so it's around about this region of this diagram. Okay. JWST, with its enhanced sensitivity, should be able to observe any galaxy in the universe. And so it should be able to directly observe objects back to redshifts of 10 to 15 back here. Okay. Serendipitously, the HST can observe more or has observed more distant objects, but that's been due to gravitational lensing. So you can see something very distant in the universe if it happens to be something that's nearer by but is massive enough to focus the light by its gravitational lensing. Anyway, that, that gives you a context, it's meant to give you a context for this really big leap in sensitivity. So how is that achieved? Well, uh, okay, so it's, it's achieved through a process, something called passive cooling that we use. The basic idea is, is by cooling down the observatory to um, 40 Kelvin, so whatever that is, minus 207, 230 degrees C, something like that, uh, but it's, uh, it's 40 Kelvin, um, you, you make the, uh, the your, you are, you are, uh, your background, your infrared light background is reduced to very, well, to nothing. Um, it, it can't be seen above the kind of the quantum noise associated with this kind of observation. Uh, and so, JWST will be sitting at the darkest place in the inner solar system. It will be a million miles away from Earth at the L2 Lagrangian point, but which is pretty dark anyway, but it's going to be super made super dark because of this sun shield that sits between the spacecraft and the sun. So I think in this diet, I, 
I made this diagram a few months ago. And so here, this is a picture from people on the beach, I think in Bournemouth last year. The, the analogy in my mind is always, if you, if you imagine sitting on a beach in the late afternoon and it's lovely and sunny and, and, and warm, when the sun goes away, if you can't see the sun, in other words, the sun, you know, you've had a few beers and you fall asleep and you wake up and it's, it's seven at night and it's gone dark, your body heat has radiated away into the dark sky and you feel really cold. And so that's the kind of, that's what the JWST principle is working on, but without the cheap lager. So it's, it's uh, the idea is that if you, if, you sh if you shade the observatory, the spacecraft from the sun, then all it can do thermodynamically is radiate its heat away into the dark sky, which is at a t an effective temperature of about four Kelvin. So very, you know, close to absolute zero. So it just cools and cools and cools and cools. And, uh, and, and as I say, ends up at an equilibrium temperature of 40 Kelvin. And that happens without a refrigerator, without having to pour liquid cryogens into it or anything like that, just by being in the shadow. And so this, and it's worth saying, this was conceived by one of our ex-colleagues, sadly he died a few years ago, Tim Harden at the, at the uh, in Edinburgh, back in the 90s, lovely bloke. Anyway, um, so summary of the mission then. It's going to be launched on an Ariane 5 from Karoo. Uh, currently, the expectation is that'll be end of October, early November this year. Um, yeah, yeah, this is a very old slide. Candidate launch windows start in October 2018. Yeah, right. We've actually had launch dates even earlier than that on the project. I've been working on this for about 20 odd years now. And uh, our first launch dates were, I think, 2011. Anyway, five year minimum mission, uh, 10 year goal, uh, four instruments. Uh, so, as I said, Three of them, FGS, NERCAM, NERSPEC, NIR for near infrared, working from, well, half a micron up to five microns. The 0.5 microns is the FGS, which is just a guide camera, really, so it's not going to be doing much astronomy. But MIRI, our instrument that we built in, in, uh, in Europe, led from Edinburgh, five to 28 microns. Okay, I've explained the, uh, the passive cooling already, so I won't go through that again. Um, oh, 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 oh. And, and that we will be orbiting at, at L2. And so, you know, you can get this stuff pretty well on, online and, um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that, I think that covers those, those things. Okay, so, so the key thing then in, a, we, we, in achieving this sensitivity is the bit was, the, was having a, a big telescope that's very cold. Why is the big mirror important? Well, the big mirror, it, is, it, it helps with the sensitivity. It helps, make, it helps with that big sensitivity gain because not only is it cold, which cuts down the background light, but it's also intercepting 25 square meters of, of, of sky, yeah, of, of light from a distant object. Whereas the Spitzer, Spitzer, which was, as I say, previous best, had a, a primary mirror the size of a dustbin lid. Uh, and so it was collecting less than a square meter. So you've got a you know, order of magnitude increase in collecting area. But that big mirror also uh, gives you a, a big, in, big gain Factor of eight here in spatial resolution and the amount of detail you can say, see. Um, so this is, um, you know, this is diffraction limited optics that we're talking about, which again, most of you will be familiar with. Um, big aperture, small star, small stellar images. Okay, and so this is a, a, a comparison where we have a simulation on the right of a MIPS observation. This is a Spitzer observation of a galaxy, a distant galaxy. And you can see that the advantage you have with MIRI is that we can break down this essentially single blob that doesn't really tell you much about in detail about what's going on in this distant galaxy. But you can break it down into star forming regions and the, and the you know, an active nucleus and supernovae and all of that sort of stuff all going on separately, just from the images. Okay, that's just from the images. The other thing that we can do with MIRI and with NERSPEC as well in the near infrared is, is take this light and split it up into spectra which are equivalent to having an image or, or to having um, um, 5,000 images, each one of which is at a slightly different wavelength, slightly different color. And it's those spectra which give you the fingerprints of, of the real chemical uh, components that, of, of the objects you're looking at. Okay, who, I've got a bit of a sidetrack, uh, but who built MIRI? And this is one of the most important, you know, <laughs> important messages to get out for me, really. Uh, it, okay, Miri, a true international collaboration. Uh, um, I can't remember the numbers, but it's of the order of 20 institutes in sort of 12 or so different nations in, in, around Europe and the US. 
Um, but um, but it's it's been a collaboration of all of the leading instru infrared instrumentation experts in Europe. Uh, so the people who I used to be competing with in the 80s and 90s. Uh, when I was in my early early part of my career, we've all got together to build Miri, to, to build Miri, which has been really very kind of you know satisfying. But it's also a great story to tell, I think, uh, in terms of um, of of you know the the importance of of uh, of engineering and 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 technology and the accessibility of this kind of you know, world changing project. Hopefully, if it doesn't go in the sea, uh, it, it, this sort of world changing project. That, that it's accessible from you know, ordinary students in schools in, in the UK and, and around Europe. That's great. Anyway, uh, we have led the project from Edinburgh. So, uh, so we've got the PI, Gillian Wright, my boss in Edinburgh. Um, uh, I'm the, the uh, commissioning lead instrument scientist, that sort of thing. Uh, we have the optics lead up here. Uh, we've, we, we had the mechanical engineering lead, all for the MIRI instrument, I should say, up in, uh, up in Edinburgh. <clears throat> And now this group of people, there are 50 or so people on the team, uh, will be getting together to commission the instrument, which means running the operations in the, in the operation center, which will be in Baltimore in, in the US um, for the first six months after launch, making sure that everything is working as it should be, doing the initial observations, initial calibrations to just check everything out and get it working so that it's ready for the subsequent five, hopefully 10 year science mission. So I've just got, to, again, just to kind of make this a bit, a bit uh, you know, illustrate this, here's a picture of MIRI as it was in the lab at, uh, at the Rutherford Appleton Labs in Oxford, where we, we tested it back in 2010. So this is a decade old picture. Um, and so this is the instrument wrapped up in its reflective um, 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 multi-layer insulation layer. Okay. But um, so RAL key, key, uh, were a key support for the instrument. They did the thermal engineering for it. This is with the MLI stripped off. These are the, the metal components that make up the instrument. Um, and so that's, that's all of MIRI. Okay, at the heart of MIRI though, the, this metal bit here is it's the deck. This was uh, designed and built in Leicester. So where the Sp National Space Center is. Um, the, the legs here are designed, built in Denmark, carbon fiber from Denmark. Um, we've got the detectors here. These are three detectors, one in, in the imager, we'll talk about this in a little bit, one in the imager, two in the spectrometer, uh, uh, built at uh, JPL, put together at JPL. Um, this is the, the, uh, the imager, the camera itself. You can see the wee filter wheel here, holds the different filters that click round and select different colors for the observations. France, that's uh, outside Paris. Uh, the uh, the Box with a spectrometer with a bunch of mirrors in it. That was in the Netherlands. Uh, this is our spectrometer, our, our, our element of the spectrometer. Those boxes in the previous picture, they bolt onto these the holes you see on either side here. Inside here, this, this gold square here is a diffraction grating that disperses white light into its component colors. And here's, uh, here's Tom Bailey, our technician in Edinburgh, putting this together. So as I say, real international collaboration. And to zoom in in that in some detail, even within Sort of optical elements inside the instrument. We have the optics that I was showing you built in the Netherlands. The mechanisms themselves. The, these are on these gratings are on wheels that plunk around to select different wave bands. Built in Germany, uh, but we built the uh, the casing. We we designed the optics and and built uh, built lots of the 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 integral field units that, that is an integral part of the spectrometer. Built built here in Scotland. So it's a real you know. A real good story about teamwork, I would say. <laughs> okay, so quickly go through the the images, the the, the image, go through the um, the instrument functions or the instrument capabilities. So what's what has Miri got, and what will the pictures look like that you'll you'll see when they come out, hopefully early next year. So we have an imager. This is the imagers field. You can see that it's uh, so you know this is a, again a simulation of of one of our first observations that we'll make. Where you can see these would be stars in the large Magellanic cloud that we're going to use as one of our calibration targets early on in the mission. Um, basically, because we can get lots and lots of stars in a single snap, in a single picture. So, this is what a, a, a 5.6 micron wavelength image would look like taken with the imager. So, this is, you know, you understand it's a picture, there are all the stars. Off on the left here, you can see there's this, these interesting kind of other, other, other fields of view. These, these one, two, three, four apertures are each uh, coronagraphs. So 
it's pretty obvious with this top one. This is a, a classical Leo coronagraph. You can see the actual hardware that's doing this over on the left here that's in the focal plane of the image. It's a black dot. If you want to look at for an exoplanet, the idea here is that you take this, you, you know there's a star, you, you think there might be an exoplanet nearby, you position the spacecraft so that the star is behind this black dot. And so that, that squashes the light from the star and hopefully you'll see faint structure around there. These other elements are also coronagraphs, but they just use a, a smarter way of, of, uh, of blocking out that central light. They're for, called four quadrant phase masks. If anyone asks me a question afterwards, and if, there, if there's time, I'm happy to explain how they work. But that's one of the things I'm telling I was I, the points I was making earlier about how much the JWST science is being pointed towards exoplanets now. One other issue that we have with JWST, it, which is a sort of, sort of interest, is we are so sensitive with JWST that most of the objects that astronomers are used to looking at are far too bright for us to, to just point our image around them and take a picture. We would saturate on most objects. And so we've gone to some effort to define subarrays, little areas of the detector, where if something is too bright for us, we can put a target on one of these subarrays and by reading out the detector really fast, we can increase our dynamic range. Okay, okay. Again, I can talk about the details of that offline if you want. Okay, that was the imager. We also have, as I say, two detectors for the spectrometer. And, and so this is a, a picture of the JWST's kind of focal plane, you know, where, where all of the instruments are picking out their light out of the, the shared beam. There's the corner of the imager field with the, you know, the, the coronagraphs would be off on the right here. And it's this little square here, so very small spatial coverage on the sky, but that is, uh, that's the light that, where we intercept light for our, our medium resolution spectrometer, the MRS. So it's only a field of seven by seven arc seconds on the sky, on, on the side. Um, to get an idea of scale on the, on the sky, uh, the moon Io is about one arc second across, one arc second diameter. So we could take a nice, you know, we could fit Io nicely within our field of view of the medium resolution spectrometer. And so what does that do? Well, I won't go into the details, but what it's take doing is taking the full 5 to 28 micron swathe of spectrum, all of that light, and it's splitting it uh, not just spatially. So it, it, it slices up the image. Okay, And so we actually, at, at our shortest wavelengths, we get 20 slices through that 7 by 7 arc second field but it's also then dispersing the light spectrally. So we get thousands of spectral samples as well. So with the MRS, we end up with, I mean, these are what the images will look like. So we've got um, uh, each spectrum that we take occupies half of our, one of our detectors. We have four detectors, so you get four spectral images simultaneously. This is a, a, a kind of a made up image that I've created. The one on the right is what you would see if you were looking at an extended target. In other words, something that was, you know, like Jupiter, actually, that would fill the field completely. Jupiter is one of the things we plan on looking at early on in the mission. On the left is if you look at a point source where you've sliced through the point source at several locations. and You can just see these wee stripes here that are the, that are the spectra of, um, of, of a slice through IO. That's how you could imagine it. OK. Um, yeah, that's probably 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 enough to, to say that. So that the data product we get out of the MRS, the thing that the, the astronomer actually would receive, it isn't just an image, it's a data cube. So it will have a seven by seven arc second spatial information uh, with about 20 pixels in each dimension. But then in the third dimension, it will have these thousands of spectral samples. Okay. And so I hope, yeah, good. And so the, this slide is showing why that has, why that's so important, particularly for exoplanet science. I'm, I'm not far off finishing. Uh, and so um, this on the top left, I mean, it's, this is kind of an old, an old, an old image, an old uh, slide, but it's, it's still valid. Uh, so this is showing what Spitzer could do. These are the blue dots here, where Spitzer could just take, really just take pictures um, of, of these exoplanets. And so you'd get one, two, three, four, five, maybe half a dozen samples of what the spectrum is at particular specific wavelengths. Whereas in, re you know, and what people tried to do when they had this data would fit complex models, which is what this red line is, that, that are comprised of the, the influences of many um, atmospheric components, many different molecules. 
here in the bottom right, you see the kind of atmospheric fit that they're, that they're trying to extract from this very, very limited for half a dozen data points. And clearly it's a bit of a fool's errand. Yeah. Uh, you really can't constrain a very complex atmospheric model with only six data points. What MIRI can do for this kind of object is actually measure the red, the red complex curve. And so you're constraining a complex model with hundreds of parameters with thousands and thousands of data points. So you've got much more chance of doing. So the aim is that we can actually understand the atmospheric. So this is variation of abundances of molecules with, with height in an extra an extra solar exoplanet atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> Okay, I might uh, skip forward a wee bit. I've got a couple of slides on, on, on the test program that we've done over the past few years. Um, just a couple of, uh, of highlights. One of them, you, know, you'll be, you may remember, when HST was first launched, its optics were out of focus. And so bright stars actually appeared as these kind of extended pancake images, which was, was fixed using something called CoStar. Astronauts fitted a new, you know, a pair of spectacles onto the spacecraft um, a couple of years after launch. We can't do that with JWST. We can't get out to L2 and fix it if the optics aren't properly aligned. And so there has been a lot of effort to actually align, you know, test the instrument as it will, or the telescope, the entire observatory, as it will fly. And so a couple of years ago, 2017, we went to, to uh, Texas, where they had the, still had the vacuum chambers that we used for testing the Apollo mission. And uh, as we'll see on the next slide, the JWST was tested in, the, in, that, in that kind of vacuum chamber. <clears throat> the thing is, you know, the, what the point about this though, we could that would we could get the JWST, put it in uh, into this chamber, evacuate it, cool it down, just as it will be at L2, but we couldn't really simulate directly having a star an infinite distance away because the vacuum chamber was only wasn't big enough. Yeah. So real stars are a long way away. So that we got around that <clears throat> by putting flat mirrors in front of the spacecraft, just above above the observatory up here. And then generating artificial stars in the focal plane of the, of the observatory. And then we could either observe them directly, which is the green beam, so point them downwards, and that, and, and, and that, that would check out the optical path between this focal plane and our instrument. Or we could actually shoot them up, bounce them back off these mirrors, so they would you know, be equivalent to. to, to coming in from infinity, parallel rays of light coming from infinity, and then observe them. Neither of those two optical prescriptions is how we're actually going to use the observatory. And so what we ended up with, I mean, these, are, these are real images, test images that show the, the sources, okay? Uh, this is for looking down, the, the down away, you know, looking downwards version. <clears throat> this is what we actually observed in test. And this is what we were correlating it with. In other words, this is what the optical modeling told us we should expect to see. <clears throat> now these agree with each other. This isn't what we're gonna see on orbit because we're gonna use the full telescope, yeah? uh, not half the telescope, um, but we are reliant on the optical modeling being right. Okay? So we haven't actually tested the instruments properly. And these for information, these are, the, these are going, the, the light going the other way where we go up to the flat mirrors and then send them back down. And we have the same sort of thing. These images correlate very well with what we expect to see in practice. Uh, or sorry, what we expect from the optical prescription of the telescope when it's properly aligned, but they aren't what we'll see in practice. So there's a bit of a fingers crossed that we that the telescope is well aligned. The other thing I'd say about that test is just to, you know, as an aside, is that we were testing the spacecraft during a, uh, a hurricane. And it was remarkable how, uh, how, how poor the waterproofing was on the, on the on the uh, test building we were using. I, th I don't think they'd fixed the roof since, since the Apollo time. Okay, so yeah, what, where are we now? So uh, our team, the MIRI team, we are responsible for planning, execution, and analysis of all of the commissioning me measurements made in the first six months after launch. And currently, as I say, launch in October, 2021. So we are getting into a, it's a kind of frenzy of activity, getting ready for launch and, and uh, flight operations. So these, this is the operations room that we will be in, um, ex we are expected to be in, uh, subject to COVID actually, uh, in, uh, in October. We'll be running 24 hours, um, eight hour shifts, two persons on console. So this is our console here. So here's Maka, Isha and Sarah, and uh, yeah, and me looking, looking jaunty. Um, um, it, it, at our station there, 
we have 50 people on the team uh, who will be, as I say, running two persons per shift, three shifts per day for the first 180 days, so about a thousand shifts of operation. Our responsibility is uh, monitoring that tiny wee screen you can see there is, is our housekeeping data. Uh, that, that, so we have to monitor four or 500 telemetry points. These are voltages, currents, and so on, which tell us that the instrument is healthy, that it's at the right temperature, it's not warming up, that the, the, uh, the data flow is happening right, all of the subsystems on the spacecraft are working properly. Um, we also have to execute the observations that we want to make, schedule them, um, um, and then have a quick look at the data to check that the, the, the data looks like what we expect to see. We then also have a if you're not on console, then it's very likely on the MIRI team that you, are, you have been um, um, uh, detailed to analyze the data in real time. And so the team at the moment are writing Python code to, to, to do automated analysis of the data sets as they come out of the spacecraft. So this is one of my key areas, which you saw this image earlier. This is this LM, LM, the, the Large Magellanic Cloud image. Um, we use this for calculating distortions in the instrument. You know, optical distortions. So, so um, you know, a square on the sky. If we if we were to see a square object on the sky, you know, hope we don't. It'd be a bit scary. Uh, it wouldn't actually be square on the detector. It would be slightly curved or whatever. And we need we measure that by observing thousands and thousands of stars. You can't go away and do that by hand later. So this is automated now. So we should be able to get our distortion map out within minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so community interest. Um, so like we, we've got our, uh, the, the, the community, thank goodness, is extremely enthusiastic about using uh, uh, JWST as a whole, but it's turned out that MIRI and NERSPEC have been particularly popular. So the whole pro observing program, the, for the first year, cycle one is the first year of, of operations. So this, this would start in, I think, April, 2022, was oversubscribed by a factor of four, which is, is is actually, you know, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty good. Um, it's, not, it's not unusual, I, I, what I was getting at, that, that sort of oversubscription. But we're glad it's an, it's an oversubscription of, of several and isn't one and a half, right? Um, but spectroscopy with MIRI and NERSPEC, which are both European instruments. NERSPEC was built, though, by um, um, Astrium, I think, um, or Airbus. Um, they are the most popular types of observation requested. Uh, MIRI is, 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 is uh, the MIRI MRS that I was showing you earlier is, uh, is looking at getting, I think it's 40 odd percent of all observations, um, all spectroscopic observations, sorry, are no, 48 percent of all spectroscopic observations uh, use the MIRI MRS. <clears throat> um, yeah, and so there is this, this, uh, this page, uh, put a link here, that is, is worth, I think, anyone looking at because it just gives you kind of a headline of what the, uh, the science programs are. And in fact, I've got this up. I'll just put, if I drag this, I presume you can see this on the shared screen. And so here you see it's divided up by subject area, exoplanets, galaxies, you know, whatever, bit of solar system in there as well. But in terms of the exoplanets and disks, um, which is the new, you know, the, the, in some ways, you know, the most exciting topic at the moment, really, uh, very much in fashion in astronomy at the moment, you can hear the individual observations and what they're aiming to do. Um, you'll see the words molecules will appear a lot, atmosphere will appear a lot in the air, cloud, clouds appear a lot in these observations, uh, these planned observations. These are all been allocated time, I should say. Um, and um, um, this is the instrument that they're asking for. So you look, MIRI MRS, MIRI MRS, there's no spec, but MIRI MRS, our coronagraphs in here, and so on. And many, many of these are MIRI MRS. So that's all great. Kind of worthwhile building it. Okay, um, and so uh, the first science results, if we launch October, November time, they should start to appear in the early new year. Okay. I mean, if, if out of just out of, just for fun, this is our uh, <clears throat> our commissioning plan, and so each one of these black boxes in here is uh, is an an observa observing activity. The numbers here, the L in red. This is the day when these ob observations are scheduled to happen after launch. So L plus 125.2, uh, I can't think when that is, but it'll be sometime in February 2022. We will be making a distortion measurement of the Large Magellanic Cloud. So the reason I, ha I had it open here was that uh, this one, L plus 155, 
this MIRI EROs, these are early release observations. So they, there are a set of particular, what are regarded as being particularly kind of exciting scientific observations. Uh, I think there's a solar system observation in here. There are some star formation regions to do the kind of the equivalent of the, the um, you know, the Eagle Nebula observations that uh, Hubble did. And so these are, are due around L plus 155. When you, you can you know, figure out when that is yourself, I guess. Uh, what's that? I think that's it. Okay, yeah, that, I, 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 that was kind of quick, but I, I'm hoping that, you know, there'll be some questions that we can, uh, we can spend. That was, that was a bit longer than I was hoping for. Yeah, so that's the end. There's our rocket. Uh, there's our telemetry pages. There's the uh, a recent picture of the of the instrument, uh, all folded up now. It's it's all stowed and ready. You know, the next time that we'll try and uh, try and uh, deploy the primary mirror and the the sun shield and all of the those bits, that'll be on orbit now. Wow. So it better work. Yeah. <laughs> Well, absolutely. And, and thank you very much for that overview. Uh, it, it's amazing how every time you hear somebody else involved with the project talk about it, you learn new things about the mission. My, my, my absolute favorite takeaway from this is your data cubes, that dimensional aspect of, of what it's going to be able to do. I, that hadn't occurred to me before that that was such an important part of what 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 this mission is going to achieve. Yes. And yeah, exactly. And uh, the thing about that is that is that that whole area of spectroscopy of the, of the data cubes, the simultaneous image, in, the spatial information, in other words, an image, and the colors as well, uh, it's not really that vital for the, the kind of the high redshift stuff. There is, there is an application there, but it really comes into its own when you're looking at exoplanet atmospheres. And so I've got a PhD student, Niall, who's a brilliant guy. He's, uh, he's been working on, on uh, predicting the spectra that we will see with the MRS and then figuring out what sort of information you can get out about atmospheric constituents. So it's, you know, the water abundance, the carbon dioxide abundance, all of that sort of stuff. He has weird kind of metallic cloud elements as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Now we have had questions coming in and Olivia right. very kindly has been uh, answering some of them as we've gone along, uh, but we'll circle back to some of them to get a little bit more information. Um, one of uh, question that uh, one of our lead educators, Ian asked um, was, uh, if the Webb telescope were to perform the same observation as the Hubble ultra deep field, so we, we had a shot of the ultra deep field in your presentation there, yep. um, how many galaxies or how many times more galaxies would you expect to be able to visualize with Webb than Hubble? Uh, yes, it, 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 okay, so yeah, it, it's a key question for the, for the mission really. Um, it is going to do the, the, uh, the, um, a similar field. I think it may even be the, the, the deep field as well. It's going to be, it, 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 and, and there will be tens of thousands of seconds. Um, so um, <clears throat> tens or, well, actually hundreds of hours put into it to get a deep image. Um, it, it will be, it will go deeper than the Hubble deep field. So there will be a higher spatial density, but it won't have the same coverage. I think. Mm. I'm pretty sure it won't have the same um, aerial coverage on, on the sky, um, but yes, but it will go deeper. There will be that. Well, if everything's working properly, yes, it will go deeper. It it should have more galaxies and more distant galaxies in it. So many of those uh, Redshift Seven galaxies, the brighter objects you see in the Hubble Deep Field, we would be we would get spectra of them rather nice. than just a straight image. Yeah, um, and uh, but but yeah, there should be more more blobs. And, and <laughs> yeah. excellent. And Olivia did it. Into high redshift stuff, so I just call them all blobs. But, yeah. Blobs is fine. They well, they look like red blobs on the on the <laughs> image. To be fair, that they get released. Yeah. Uh, Olivia has posted a simulation in her reply on that uh, question uh, to to see what kind of a difference you might get to have. So, lead educators do go uh, check that one yeah. out. I, I've got to say, I mean, there's a. I I I, I don't find I don't find the the uh, the. Um, the predictions of what JWST will that dramatic. I don't think it's massively dramatic, um, really. But the, but uh, that's partly because but, I mean the key things to remember about it is that Hubble was working in the visible, where diffraction gives you much better image quality. Mm. And so for the JWST, the images will look a wee bit sharper than Hubble, but it but they are being taken at a much longer wave at a longer wavelength, not much yeah. longer, but at a longer wavelength. 
uh, where the where it's it's uh, where the the basic you know diffraction is broadening things. So yes, they do look sharper, but not orders of magnitude. They are a lot deeper, but that is you know it's not that apparent from those images, I think. But they do look better. Yeah, they do look better. Right, okay, and, and, and perhaps yeah. tie, uh, tying in with that, uh, another one of our lead educators, Alan, says, uh, as I understand it, the JWST is a general purpose telescope like mm -hmm. HST, yeah. and as such, it may be that its most exciting discoveries will be ones that we don't expect. That said, yeah. Yeah. what are you most excited about in terms of the observational capabilities it will bring? Um, right. Uh, well, for me, I mean, as I say, I am actually involved in a couple of those programs on the, on the, in the GEO cycle. I've also got, got a G, GTO involvement. For me, it is primarily the exoplanet. Now, JWST will not be able to observe um, Earth-like exoplanets. Uh, there's nothing on the, car, on the horizon for the next 10 or 20 years uh, in terms of instrumentation that can really you know, see an, ex, an exo-Earth and measure ozone in its atmosphere and say there is oxygen. Um, but, uh, but it's the observations of exo-Jupiters, trans-Neptunian planets, you know, those kind of uh, 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 planets that are uh, the super-Earths. Uh, and so that's really where, where our interest lies, I think. In, 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 it's, 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 that's the stuff I'm most interested in. And, and I'm involved in quite a few of those programs where the excitement there is, is in some of the objects that we know about, we would have the ability with JWST to determine if they have an atmosphere at all. Uh, this would apply to uh, some of the Trappist planets and, uh, and some of the new nearby uh, uh, planets as well, Things, and possibly the um, uh, the uh, the um, Eta Sen uh, planet, um, but but then it's it's it, it's also to study the impact, which is getting a bit more kind of nerdy. But one of the problems with understanding these exoplanet spectra, I mean, I highlighted it with Spitzer, where you just get the colours and you really need the spectrum. But it's it's it, the interpretation of those spectra uh, is very dependent on the on the cloud on the on the, on the existence of clouds and the target object. And so when you're starting to, at stars, it's easy because all the clouds get burned, burned away to nothing. But if you look at Jupiter in our own solar system, you can see the banding of the clouds. And if you look at an infrared image of Jupiter, uh, sort of thing that's uh, uh, Lee Fletcher in Leicester is, is one of the, the key people um, for, for observing these things. You see the, those, those clouds as dark regions because they are cutting out, you know, you, they're cold mm. and high up. Whereas but between the clouds, you can see deep into the warm, dense atmosphere of Jupiter and things look a lot brighter. So all we will get, all the people have got to date is a dot with a spectrum. And, and, without, and they haven't really addressed the fact that those, the, those clouds, the abundance of clouds and the weather patterns really are impacting on those spectra quite significantly. And so that's what with, with a student, Niall, that's one of the areas where we're really, that's what we're really excited by. It's having data of the quality because it's this this, this spectral information yeah. that will allow us to determine what the kind of the weather is going on, on on these planets, what the cloud abundance is, whether they have the same kind of cloud patterns that we see in something like Jupiter. We can't image it. We will have no. to infer this from it's still a point of light. We'll have to infer this information from our spectra. But the JWST is so kind of it's, it's really kind of overkill for this yeah. kind of observations. But that's the, with the interest. Um, yeah, and, there and is it, always, there's always the hope that if you look at one of these exoplanets, the, these, these water giants, you know, ocean covered planets, it'd be really funny if we actually did see a massive ozone feature. From it. Oh, wouldn't it just? We could, we could do that. <laughs> really cool, wouldn't it? That'd really, you know, like maybe it was a planet that was all ocean, but most of that ocean was full of plankton. Yeah, um, 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 and that, that, that's the key thing, uh, looking at a lot of... Um, things that are being released about exoplanet atmospheric composition at the moment is that you know oxygen is, is a key thing and the production of oxygen or presence of oxygen being so linked to potential life life processes yeah i mean that's the thought yeah i mean i think in, in more general terms it's it's non-equilibrium chemistry is the thought exactly it's, it's any chemistry that, in, that implies that you've got something going on that is not going to be stable over a billion years and so in the case of the Earth, you know, the idea is that if we if if we if all life was dead on Earth overnight, if everything was wiped out, um, then uh, then uh, the, the oxygen would be reabsorbed into the rocks in yeah. tens of millions of years. Okay. So in terms of a snapshot of a, of a planet that's been around for a billion or two billion years, if you see a lot of oxygen there, 
then it's kind of an indicator that either there's weird chemistry happening or there's life. Yeah, yeah but, some but, kind but, of process that is producing it rather than just a, a presence. Exactly. And we can see ozone. We'll definitely can, could detect ozone if it's present. But at the moment, we can't a priori, ex, you know, but we can't. The trouble is we can't see an Earth, an Earth sized planet. Really. Yeah. Like planet. I mean, that, that, that is, is so exciting. And, yeah. I, I, you know, a lot of our lead educators, some of our more our older lead educators in terms of the organization, you know, when we started up in 2008, 2009, we were working towards that kind of 2011 ish original window and so you know we, we've been we've been taken with this and planning Edu olivia can can uh, agree with me on this you know we, we we are just so excited for it to go ahead we have had some questions come in as well on the on the technical side so um you showed us how you tested the optical imaging systems to make sure that you know we don't get a hubble mark ii happening yeah. Um, but Connor wanted to know, um, how do you then maintain the alignment of the optical systems during launch or can they be realigned remotely? What, what are the kind of tolerances that we've got in terms of not disrupting that optical setup? Yeah, right. Good, yeah, good, good point. Yeah. Well, this is, as I say, this is the spacecraft essentially as it is now. Yeah, this image of, I, am I still sharing, by the way? I am, yeah? Yep. Yeah, great. And so, yeah, it, it's completely folded up, right? And so... Everything on here has to deploy. I mean, uh, there are videos that, that you can see online but, of, of it, but it's, it's the most complex deployment ever attempted in space. Right? That deployment, it's not just a case of unfolding the mirrors and everything's going to be perfectly aligned. Each one of the, of the 18 mirror segments is on, uh, is on a, a uh, you know, tip tilt. Uh, has, it can be adjusted in whatever it is, uh, three axis, in, out, left, right, up, down, tip, tilt, and roll. Um, you can do all of that. And all of that is necessary. Uh, it will be it, the the spacecraft will not be aligned when it is launched and cooled down. And so, yeah. uh, and so the the way this the, the way it happens is that uh, there is there's other stuff I wish I could show you actually. But there's uh, is that NERCAM, the near infrared camera, um, is, uh, is is the idea is you 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 look at a, in, in simple terms you look at a star. Um, what you expect to see is uh, is is um, if things are, it, 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 is that things should be well enough aligned so you will at least get an image by each in, taken by each individual primary mirror segment. And so then the idea is to essentially adjust all of those, steer those images to all make one spot, but that still wouldn't be um, um, phased up properly. You then have to, um, well, in fact, what you do is you take the secondary mirror, that also can be moved. And so you can make, you can defocus the whole observatory uh, quite severely by a couple of centimeters and take very out of focus images. And by analyzing those out of focus images, you can see the phasing of the different, of the 18 different mirror elements. When I say phasing, I mean, you know, light is a wave. And so if that's, <laughs> there's one wave coming from one segment, you want all of those wave fronts to line up and not be, you know, interfering with each other. And so that phasing up is done by these, taking these out of focus images and then adjusting each of the mirrors um, accordingly. It's all called, this, this stuff all happens with, with NERCAM. NERCAM gets cold um, a, uh, a, a couple of, well, I think it, it gets cold after only about two months into the mission. So that's gonna start off fairly, fairly early on. So there's the basic deployment to just get everything, you know, get the, 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 um, the sun shield deployed that happens during the first month while it's traveling out to L2. Uh, but then after that, it's stable, it points at a star and it, and it then has to be aligned um, um, explicitly, remotely from the ground. So it's a really, that's a big deal. And so a lot of our rehearsal exercises, uh, there, there are, are these there's, um, wavefront rehearsals, they call them, and, uh, where, where you're actually trying to do that alignment. Yeah, it's a big deal. Look, it's a big risky, not risky, it's, but yeah, complex, no, complex. Risky, yeah. <laughs> the chance of failure. That's risky, isn't it? Yeah. I'm yeah, really, I think I, really I spoke. I spoke to one of the engineers <laughs> on it, and uh, this was this was many years ago, and um, he said something along the lines <laughs> of, of an offhand comment of, "Oh, it's all right. There's only something like one thousand seven hundred and fifty-six individual point of failures exactly. options." <laughs> I was just like, "Okay, this is <laughs> technical." In terms of the accuracy, the mirror alignment is or our our entire way the wavefront. You know that phasing. Has to be right to um, it's 50 nanometers. Oh, yeah. 
So it's like it. it's 50 billionths of a meter. Um, the, um, yeah, so much, much, it's much, much shorter than the wavelength. It's a very small fraction of the wavelength of the light we're observing. Uh, Ab abs yeah. Absolutely. Um, we've got time <clears> for a couple more questions. We have got quite a few that have come in. Um, so James White has asked, I mean, obviously with, um, you know, the recent Mars landings, we've seen fantastic mm. footage of, uh, you know, parachute deployments and things like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. And James is asking what si sort of engineering cameras, if any, are on board to show the deployment of the mirror and the sun shield? None. It's a real shame. And none. Ah. I don't, I mean, you know, I, I kind of don't care either way. You know, I, I, yeah. I just, uh, yeah, um, none. It would, and I, you know, it would be so useful. If there was any chance of getting anything fitted now, um, there may have been something fitted very recently because people have been pressing for it, but for a long time there has been nothing at all. Uh, I, I say I say useful because it may well be useful as a diagnostic. If we think that if we think that there might if, if there's a split in the in the sun shield, yeah, then it would be so nice to to to, to be able to determine that with it by having a GoPro mounted on that's taken a yeah, picture. Yeah, ten rather than try to infer it from telemetry. So yeah, I know it's a, it's a, real, um, a real shame. Ah, I just imagine that how spectacular that would look as well, if you could see, see oh, the yeah. actual deployment. Yeah, Maybe I know. I know. I think no, no chance of sneaking in there and sneaking one on before launch? Yeah, I can, I'm, not, I'm nowhere near it now. I mean, I, I have been near the spacecraft when it was uh, involved with uh, at, at uh, Goddard and at Johnson, but it's at Northrop Grumman at the moment in Los Angeles. Uh, um, you know, it's only the Northrop Grumman technicians that get to touch it. Uh, we go out there. We did go out there for uh, for doing functional tests on on the mirror instrument, uh, but no, otherwise it's hands off. Um, yeah. Uh, Excellent. And uh, a, a question about the um, about dealing with the with the thermal differences across the spacecraft. So uh, Lee yeah. has asked, what are the technologies that are used to deal with thermal expansion and contraction issues, particularly with the mirror? Uh, analysis. It's, it's engineering analysis, yeah? I mean, so I, I don't know, a lot of students now will have um, Inventor. Uh, I know my, my, my two boys, when they were at school um, here in Scotland, they, had, they, they got li Inventor licenses free, and I'm sure that's the case. But engineering packages like that, that we use, the same kind of packages we use to design the instruments, uh, they, they have uh, physical properties that you can plug into them and, and actually work out what the thermal contraction is going to be, um, how those thermal, you know, and, Things that you need to take account of. So mm -hmm. there are there are tools to do this in practice. When I was young, I, when I was young. When I built, I, I, I have built the whole infrared instrument in myself for, for my doctorate when I was, you know, many years ago. And for that, I had to do all of that kind of analysis myself. Now there are packages to do it that will work out the heat flow through an instrument. You know, if I run a motor, it's going to generate heat. Where does that heat go? How do I conduct it to the outside world? So. Couple of points. One of them, I mean, that, that are just sort of takeaways. One of them in the pic. I won't scroll back to it, but you'll see that all of the that Miri is, is pretty well the structure and the mirrors are all made of the same grade of um, aerospace aluminium. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, and so that is done because it will contract homologously. So as the instrument gets smaller, so the mirrors will also get smaller at just right. the same rate. Which means that if you align it warm. And it's perfectly aligned. It should be aligned perfectly when it's cold. Now that's to first order. The second mm. order, that's not really true. Okay, so you have to. There's a delta because we don't just use aluminium. We don't just use reflective elements. We have filters in there that are glassy materials. You know, so things do change a wee bit. Uh, but uh, but that yeah, it's good engineering. I mean, we have a depth of field with Miri of two millimeters. <clears throat> And as I said earlier, the, the, uh, the secondary mirror can refocus through uh, 50 millimeters. So we're going to be pretty unlucky if we're not in focus. Excellent. We've also and, uh, been cold 10 times now. So, yeah. uh, and in a, in a moment, I'm going to uh, drop Olivia in at the deep end and, and bring her into this as well to talk a little bit on the engagement and the outreach stuff. Yeah. Um, one final question to finish up on this one. This is from uh, Andrew. Bit of a philosophical devil advocate question. Yeah. What is the cost benefit of such a project? Why does it matter? Why does it matter? I think that's a elevator problem. pitch. Can you can you can you give us an answer to that in one minute? No, I wouldn't dream, I wouldn't kind of wouldn't dream of it. Okay. I think okay, I think the point of astronomy for me is the inspiration for our our, our youngsters. That is the main point. That's why I'm bothering. Sorry, that's why I'm here, right? 
<laughs> uh, this isn't my day. This isn't my day job, right? Yeah. But that's why I'm talking to you because I see you as a group who inspire young people to 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 to, to do things in engineering, science. You know, the it's the STEM stuff, right? That's what's key. That's what's driven our economy. If people are looking for money, the cost of this is nine and a half billion. In terms of the science output, the fact that it's going to make maybe one or one or two people a Nobel Prize if they're lucky, uh, <laughs> but, but and, and improve a lot of astronomers' careers. No, I don't. That isn't the purpose for me at all. Yeah, I, I actually find the astronomy side of it, a lot of it, quite frivolous. For me, the important the, it's that it's the teamwork as well. It's been the international yeah. collaboration that has been so important for me. I won't. Tell, I won't. You know, obviously, you know, can't talk about politics, so I won't. Uh, yes, that, that, that could take us off in dangerous, though interesting Absolutely. directions. We're, we're all in Perda, but that's a crucial <laughs> outcome, positive outcome of this kind of mission. It's, it's, we're up to, it's like 2,000 engineers, most of them now in the US, but we have, um, during commissioning, we're talking about a team of 500 people running this thing. Uh, it's like playing a violin with 500 friends. Yeah. You need, it's, so it's, it's a good thing to do. It, on a Excellent. kind of human scale, that's what I'm saying.